welcome to Flourishment, the podcast on living life as you were meant to, so you can flourish. Welcome, everyone. I am delighted to have with me a missionary, a wonderful woman of God who writes about hope, perseverance, and God's grace. Her name is Nancy K. Grace. She's a speaker, an award-winning author of The Grace Impact, a devotional about God's grace. Welcome, Nancy, and thank you for coming on Flourishment today. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I'm excited to visit with you, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to share hope. And you wanted to talk about living with bold faith. Tell us what in your background, in your heart, makes you so passionate about living with bold faith. Sure. Bold faith is something that I think all of us who are believers really need to step out into. I'll tell you first what it is not. It is not standing on a street corner with a big placard saying the end is near. That is not bold (laughs) faith. But the bold faith is living a confident life with faith in Jesus Christ. I began my life of faith. My, my parents took me to church, and it was an important part of our lives. But my parents didn't live out a lot of the tenets of faith. They did the best that they could with what they had. And I would say that I had a dysfunctional home because my father was an alcoholic. And so I lived under that shadow of uncertainty of what will home life be like? Will it be tense or will there be peace? I never knew from day to day, really. But yet I'm thankful for that because that has helped me to learn how to be an overcomer. And it because I've had to learn to live with that scar of having an alcoholic parent And let that be, it's a part of me, but it does not define me as an adult. So as a a teenager, I was struggling with low self-esteem and uh, thinking that I had to perform to be liked by anybody, that I had to be accepted. I struggled with acceptance. I was a, a people pleaser. Of course, looks are always important, especially to a teenage girl. And so I I just felt disappointed with myself that I never could reach those high expectations that I had. Uh, I was a straight A student, but if I didn't get an A, I would beat myself up emotionally and tell myself that I could do better next time, you know, but I never heard the uh, love and affirmation in my home. Well, one day I was in the choir at my church and there was a a choir that came and visited and they sang a song that absolutely gripped me. So music really speaks to my soul. And the verse that they sang about was 2 Corinthians 5, 17, which says, if anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. And I listened to that, and I was shocked to hear that it was actually in the Bible. I found out where it was, and I I learned that I could become a new creation in Christ. I didn't have to believe the lies of low self-esteem, the lies that I had to perform the best that I could all the time, and if I didn't, I wasn't worth anything. That's a lie. I could just learn to accept myself. And so when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord, I was excited to become a new creation in him. My sin wasn't maybe wasn't described as outlandish behaviors, but my sin was thinking uh, that I wasn't worth anything. And when I learned that God created me uniquely, I wanted to embrace that. I wanted to grow in that. And that has been one thing that has shaped me all the way through my life over the decades, that I I look to God for my self-worth. I listen to what he says about me. Even when I struggle, I still have to come back to what God says about me, that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So I believe that having bold faith then helped me to be able to navigate some uncertainties in my home family life. And to go off to college and be able to 
find a Christian fellowship group that I connected with and to step out of my comfort zone. Okay, I'm basically an introvert, but at that point I stepped out and I went to a, a Bible study meeting that I saw advertised in the college newspaper. I went by myself at night to a place that I didn't know and I walked in and I found the uh, love and acceptance from this fellowship of other believers. And I will say it was also there that I met my husband. You know, he was the president of the fellowship. And so as president, he made sure he introduced himself to me and then gave me a ride home and then asked me back the next week and so on and so on. So anyway, it, it became an important place uh, for me and for us, but I learned a lot about God's grace there. And so as I've grown, I've had to learn more about faith and learning about faith is a lifelong process. And at different points, different scriptures have just really spoken to me. My husband has been a, a pastor. We've been in church ministry for more than 45 years, and he retired just about 18 months ago. And in that time of being in church ministry, I've had to learn to really trust God and depend on him and look to him for validation, to look for him uh, for his great love. During this time, one thing that I've had to really grapple with, as well as learning how to accept my past uh, from having a dysfunctional family, but I came to the point, I'll, I'll just kind of conclude on that part of my life by saying God gave me peace in that I know that I'm an overcomer because of all that I learned by living at home. And I learned perseverance and I learned stick to and the faith to keep going. And I'm grateful for that. So as we've grown in ministry and as a young mother, when I was uncertain with how am I raising my children? What do I do? I don't know how to do this, Lord. But through looking to God, I had to learn that I, I serve him only. The audience of one, if you would, that God's opinion is what matters to me, not what other people think. And that has been something that I've had to really cling to and embrace in raising my family as a pastor's wife. So that is something that, you know, is part of, you know, having that bold faith is knowing I know that I know that I know that God is faithful. And I know that he's faithful because I've, he's been with me as I've walked through a cancer diagnosis. Uh, several years ago, I had a sore on my tongue that would not heal. And the sore would increase, it would get worse, and then it would slightly improve. But I eventually went to the dentist and he looked at it and he said, well, come back in six months. And, and so I did, and it was still there. It was still there. And so eventually he said, do you want to go on and have someone else look at it? I said, yes, it, it was hurting. It woke me up in the middle of the night and I knew that wasn't right. I knew something was wrong. So I went to an oral surgeon and the oral surgeon thought it was an ulcer. And he said, come back in two weeks and try some, you know, a certain mouthwash, try different things. And I thought, no, something, this is not going to take care of it. It needs something else. So two weeks later, I went back to that oral surgeon and he removed the sore that was on my tongue. And as he did it there in his office, he had to remove a larger section because it was deeper than what he anticipated. So he removed the sore on my tongue and he stitched up my, my tongue. I couldn't talk, I couldn't eat. And I wondered what was going on, what is, what is this? And at that time I had just taken steps to take speaker training to become a speaker. And now I have a lame tongue and I couldn't talk. I couldn't, my name was Nancy Guace. I, I just couldn't speak right. So I went home and that night I, I was laying in bed and just praying, Lord, what is this? And then the next day I got the phone call 
from the doctor. We lived somewhat uh, an hour away from the doctor. And so he called and he said he'd gotten the biopsy report back. He almost did not send it off for a biopsy, but he said he, in his gut, decided to send it off. And so he did. And he told me, he said, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The bad news is that it's cancer. But the good news is, is that it's all been removed. It had clean margins and clean edges. And I've talked to an oncologist and blah, blah, blah going on. I'm like, wait a minute. Wait, stop. Wait. You said I have what? Cancer? I did not anticipate anything like that, although I feared it. And as a woman, I feared other kinds of cancer, but not cancer on my tongue. So that night, I went to my piano a couple hours later. I'm, and I said, I'm a musician. My husband wasn't gone. He had church meetings that night. And I went to my piano and I sat down and I played hymns. I prayed through my fingers. And I prayed tearfully. And I prayed and I released my fears to God. I released them and I received from God instead of fears, I received his deep peace. And it was a special peace, a deeper peace than I had ever known. And it was a peace that spoke to my soul that said, you'll be okay, you'll be okay. So I have clung to that peace for decades since that very first a cancer diagnosis. Now over the years, I've had several biopsies. And at that time, the they didn't think that I needed any uh, chemo or radiation because it was barely stage one. It wasn't, it was like pre-stage one. But if they saw anything suspicious, they would do another biopsy. So over the years, I've actually had eight different biopsies. Eight different times they have removed a section of my tongue. Sometimes it's a very small section and sometimes as much as a third of my tongue. And during that, I've come to realize and trust God for bold faith. I've had to go before him and I know that God is with me. He is my peace when I'm uncertain. He is my strength, my rock, my refuge. As I was recovering, I saw God as my refuge. And I was in the refuge of God's grace as I was healing each time after having these different biopsies. So, and of those biopsies, a few of them have been cancerous. Most of them have not been, but a few of them have been cancerous, which always brings up a fear once again. And I'm just going to share, it had been seven, eight years since I'd had any cancer. So, you know, I'd had some biopsies, but it was not cancerous. Well, I'm going to tell you about the last time, which was just over a year ago. I had uh, just moved away from a doctor's care who knew my history and knew, you know, had operated on me uh, many times and helped me through that. But now we had moved and I needed new medical care and I didn't know where to go. But I thought, well, I have time, I'll get it. Well, a couple months after we moved, I started to notice a sore on my tongue again. And it came back quicker this time. And it was growing and it was painful in the same area on my tongue. And I didn't know how am I going to, I didn't know who to go to. So I, I asked around and found the name of an ENT and I thought, okay, well, what's the chance of getting into seeing a specialist on short notice during the holidays? Well, I was working with some of the, some other ladies in, in our new church to do some music for a woman's event. And we were, had gotten together to, to practice at one of their homes. And I was just getting to know them. I, I didn't know them. I was new. And we're just talking and I, you know, shared that, you know, I had this history of tongue cancer and come to find out one of the other musicians was the wife of the EMT who was recommended to me. I couldn't believe it. I was just like, really? Okay. So 
how can I get in touch with him? Do you know if he's really busy right now? I, you know, what, what is, are the chances of getting in? So she texted his office and within 15 minutes, the office called me and I got a, a doctor's appointment set up for two days later. I was amazed that God provided a way for me to get in to see a specialist that quickly. So that day that I went to see him, I had a speaking event at a luncheon and I came home from the luncheon. And then um, after, you know, changing and relaxing a bit, I had this doctor's appointment with a new doctor. I introduced myself to him. I went there and he looked in my mouth. He said, I'm going to biopsy it today. I was not ready for that. I thought I would have to come back for something like that. So he did biopsy it then, right then and there. So now again, I have a sore in my, I can't talk, I can't eat. And I go home and I'm wondering what, what is going on, God? What is this? Well, this was over the holidays. And so things couldn't happen very quickly. So I had a follow-up appointment on actually December 26th. And he looked at it again and he said, we're going to do a glossectomy, which is he's going to remove another section of my tongue. So I go there on, in, in the, the days before this appointment, I was feeling fear grow in me very much, very much. And I thought, okay, I'm older now. I, it'll take longer to heal. It will why does it seem worse this time? And fear was growing in me, but God calmed down those fears. He calmed down those fears when he showed me Jesus' words that said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Do not let your hearts be troubled. All of those verses kept speaking peace to me. And so I stood with bold faith trusting God that he would take care of me once again. So when I went into the surgery, the doctor preoperatively looked in my mouth and it had gotten worse. And he extended or increased the surgical instructions. And instead of just removing the, the, the tissue on my tongue that if necessary, he would remove all the lymph nodes on the right side of my neck. And this would be a much more invasive procedure. So I go into surgery and I just had the peace of God knowing that God was with me. I had the loving support of my husband and friends and prayer support from many people across the country and even in the world. And I'm, I'm so thankful I had peace. When I came out from the surgery, the doctor told me that it was more expansive than he expected. And he had to take all the lymph nodes out of the right side of my neck. So I had a scar from my, the corner of my earlobe all the way down underneath the center of my chin. And my tongue had about, was about a third removed. And I, I couldn't talk, I couldn't eat, but I knew God's peace. And so in the time of healing, I just read God's word. I wrote out God's word. I wrote out the verses and let that penetrate into my mind, into my soul, so that when I was fearful, I knew God's word was in my heart. And as it worked out, the results of the biopsy showed that it was stage two cancer, but there was not any involvement in the lymph nodes for which I was very grateful, but it had some nerve involvement, which meant it could have traveled throughout my body. So I had appointments with the doctors to talk about radiation and or chemotherapy. And it was very confusing and very stressful because I, I, I didn't know where this was going to go. How, how would this be? And the Lord worked through our discussions and the ENT who did the surgery uh, and the others agreed that I didn't need any further treatment of radiation or chemotherapy 
right now, but my doctor would watch it. And so I was back on the schedule of going to see him every two months. And now after one year, I'm now seeing him every three months. And so the last time that I did see him in uh, December, things were looking good. And I got have an appointment three months away instead of every two months. So that's progress. But during that time, it's like, I know that God is faithful. I know that he is with me. He is good. He has comforted me. He has healed me. He's healed me emotionally from dysfunctional family. He's made me a new creation because I looked to him. It is not me. It is his spirit within me. And so when we come to him, that's when his grace touches our lives. And that's what I call the grace impact on our lives. When we interact with the grace of God and his grace touches our lives and we become that new creation because of what Jesus Christ did at the cross for our salvation. So that's kind of at the core of why I believe, you know, we have to live in bold faith. And then today when there's, there's so many uncertain times, uncertainties, the only thing that is certain is the word of God that where God says, I, the Lord do not change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And though my situation may change, I can stand firm upon the rock of faith in Jesus Christ. That is a tremendous story of overcoming a beginning in insecurity and dysfunction and being able to grow in your faith with God as he proved faithful through trials and difficulties, especially that story of surviving cancer over and over again, where God was going to minister through you the most in your speaking. Mm -hmm. So that's just an amazing story of how God cultivated that bold faith by proving himself faithful to you. Such a beautiful story. Yes, what would you, you say to those listeners out there that are struggling to have bold faith and they can't quite relate to getting where you are? Do you have sure. some tips for them on how to begin to grow that bold faith in their lives? Sure. First of all, I understand when you're only hanging on by your fingernails, maybe <laughs> pressures are all around you. You know, raising children is stressful. You know, working in different environments that can be hostile, just the uncertainties of all this that the pandemic has brought. I just really, during the pandemic, especially since I had that last cancer surgery right before the pandemic. So I'm thankful I had it then and not two months later, <laughs> but I had to focus and dwell on the Lord. It's easy for my mind to think on the negative things. And I think we, we do have a negative bias to our thinking that things are going to go bad, things are wrong, and the world is always showing us the bad things. So I think one thing that has helped me is to reverse that and to dwell on the Lord, to dwell, let his word soak into my mind. Let his word, I, I mentioned that I wrote out scripture and as I wrote it out, I prayed it and I clung to it. It's like, God, you are my rock, my refuge. And I, I would pray that, Lord, I'm, I'm struggling to believe, but help me in my unbelief. And we see that story in the New Testament that there was somebody who said that, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So we have that freedom to say that to God. And Jesus responded with love. He will respond with love and acceptance for our questions. So I would say to dwell in the Lord, let his word be in the word, find some scriptures, or you can contact me or Tina for additional scriptures on looking at who you are in Christ, looking at how God sustains and, and really let those words germinate in your heart and pray. And so that's a part of dwelling, reading the word and praying and just being still before God. 
well, you might ask, how can I be still when I have little children or I have to work? And, and even if it's just when you lay your head down on your pillow at night, just to pray and thank him for yet another day, but thank him for his strength, because even though we don't see it, his unseen strength is there. That is so good, Nancy. Thank you for sharing that. I hear you saying, just keep doing those things until you feel them. Don't wait till you feel like it to do it as well. Yes. And, and I, in the Old Testament, we have the story of Jacob, when he was wrestling with God, Jacob said, I won't let go until you bless me. Well, his name was changed and he became a leader. Okay. So I, I guess I want to just say, focus on, you know, I won't let go until you bless me is something that I've clung to when I've not been sure of like, what is going on when my husband faced possible unemployment, when I faced cancer, when we had a prodigal, our son had walked away from the Lord, and it was God, I won't let go, I will not let go of you until you bless me. And that's not bargaining with God, but it's like, I am going to cling to you and cling hard and fast. And I know that our father loves when we cling to him. He really enjoys that so much. He loves us always, but he really loves those moments when we get to get close to him and we give our cares over to him. So that's really important to remember who God is. Even when we can't feel it, we know the facts of how he is faithful. And we keep saying those things out loud and keeps praying those scriptures out loud until it changes our disposition and it changes our perspective. And sometimes that takes a while. It doesn't happen. Yes, it does. It really does. We have to be persistent. One of the messages that I think that is all throughout the Bible is persevere. Paul writes about that in a lot of his letters, you know, press on. There's a lot of, you know, we have light and momentary troubles, but we have an eternal reward. And it's a matter of where do you put your eyes? Do you look at the problem and dwell on that and the negativity of that? Or do you look up to the Lord and dwell on his goodness, his character? And even like looking up verses that about God's character helps to reframe your thinking. I I like that you said that, Tina, to remember who God is. And that gives me comfort to see how supreme, how sovereign, how loving how humble, how good, how strong God is. And that is where your strength obviously has come from. And you're just living it so well on the other end of all those struggles and and the things that you're doing now. So I so appreciate you sharing your story and all the wisdom that you have been able to develop out of that life story. Where can people stay connected with you and continue to follow you and benefit from your wisdom and your book, The Grace Impact? How can they find all of these wonderful treasures? Okay. Um, I have a website and it is my full name, Nancy K. Grace. And it's N-A-N-C-Y-K-A-Y-G-R-A-C-E dot com. Nancy K-A-Y Grace dot com. And at my website, you'll find my blog, You will find information about my book, which is on Amazon. The the Grace Impact is available in Kindle and in paperback. And I'll just mention that book, that it has, it's 30 days of devotional material that are, you know, short chapters, basically. They're not like just a couple of paragraphs, but they're short chapters about God's grace, about how we interact with God's grace, how Part of it deals with getting to know God's character and then how he interacts with us and then how he calls us to be grace givers, to go out and share that grace with other people. So at the end of each chapter, there's additional Bible studies, scriptures to look up. There are questions that you could journal on and there's a prayer. So that book could be used as a Bible study guide personally or in small groups. And I will say, if anybody is interested in doing that as a group Bible study to contact me, and I would be willing to help you or come in through Zoom to help teach about God's grace. My email address is nancy at 
nancykgrace.com. And so on my, on my website, that's where my main information is, but I'm also on Facebook. I have a Facebook page, Nancy K. Grace, speaker and author. And I'm on Twitter at, uh, at Nancy K. Grace and Instagram at Nancy K. Grace. So I love to connect. If you have any questions or want to follow up, I would love to reply to you about anything. Thank you so much, Nancy. I hope that all of you listening have enjoyed this wonderful story that Nancy has shared with us about her life and that you will connect with her to get more from her in her Grace Notes newsletter that you can sign up for on her website and with her book, The Grace Impact. I also hope that you come back for the next episode of Flourishment. Mm-hmm.